Hey, you're Addison Brazil. Yeah, I am. Hi, random British guy. Didn't you write First Year at Grief Club? A gift from a friend who gets it. Yes, I did. Did my mom pay you to ask me that? No. I'm sorry for your loss, mate. Why don't you do a podcast to help people honor their grief? You know, you're not the first person to say that. You know what? Fine, I'll do it. But it has to be with my friends who get it. And it has to be for real people who get real life grief. Oh, and it absolutely has to be equal parts, honor the journey and find the funny. What does that mean? I think you're about to find out. I'm Addison Brazil. Grief Club, the podcast starts now. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Grief Club, the podcast, where I take sections of my book, First Year of Grief Club, a gift from a friend who gets it, and use them as launching off points to talk to special guests and friends. Today, we have a very special guest, and we are talking about week seven, which is gratitude. Uh, In the book, I do say your gratitude is your grief, and your grief can be full of gratitude. And uh, as we already started to discuss off air, that can be a very loaded statement and bringing gratitude in our grief can be a challenging process. But one thing that I found that I was very grateful for throughout my grief process was being able to find anyone who made me feel a little less isolated, anybody who seemed to get what I was going through. And um, this is in some ways the way that tech was a really beautiful gift for me because there's a whole other side of Instagram past the selfies and the the TikTok dances where there's some really badass conscious creators uh, creating accounts that that really resonate and that, that I think really help through the grief process. Um, and one of those people is our guest today, Kaylee O'Connor, welcome. Hey, how are you doing? Very good. Thank you. So Kaylee is the creator of Good Grief UK, um, something that I actively follow. You guys will probably see on my Instagrams reposting all the time and um, doing that again, because what you're doing just really resonates um, as a creator um, and a founder, but also as a holistic grief coach, uh, which is something that we're seeing more and more of now. But I had trouble finding, say, 14 years ago when my journey started with my brother and um, and my father. So one thing I like to do before we start anything episode, any episode is uh, to just do a conscious emotional fitness check-in. So if you're down, uh, just kind of take a deep breath. And uh, in one word, how are you feeling right now physically? I'm feeling, I've got some anxiety, a bit nervous. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, also gonna... exciting to be. <laughs> I'm going to say energetic. Um, okay. In one word, how are you feeling mentally? Um, curious, yeah. Yeah, interested. Um, and in one word, how are you feeling emotionally? Um, balanced today. Yeah, I'm going to say grateful. And I swear I'm not just saying that because it's the theme of the week, but I really am sort of woke up in this. I finally slept after a few nights of not sleeping. Here I am explaining my one word answer when I preach not to, but um, yeah, grateful. So, um, you know, everything I do, I try to, you know, balance equal parts, honor the journey and find the funny because it's just not fun for me otherwise. So obviously for the next 30 minutes, just feel free to be your true honest self. Um, Laugh when you want to laugh. You want to cry, cry when you cry. Um, And that goes for our listeners too. But I want to start off by, instead of me sort of, you know, doing my pre-research and what I know of you, um, talking about you, just give you a chance to take, you know, a few minutes to honor your journey openly. And that can include with you, I assume it would, your, you know, your grief processes, but also just how you get to where you are today and how you introduce yourself to people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Kaylee. Um, I turned 30. Oh, I haven't said that out loud. So I've turned 30 this year. Um, <laughs> and, oh, um, I lost my dad when I was 15. So although I'd experienced grief before that, that was when I say my kind of grief journey really started for me because um growing up, I had a really, really normal, stable family um lots of love lots of laughter and um when he died it was extremely shocking sudden and changed everything and something that I talk about a lot is that grief isn't just one loss it's 
all of the losses, the secondary losses that come with losing somebody so important to you. And I guess for me with my grief journey, um, it went on a, a very weird journey at first where I blocked and blocked and blocked for maybe, I don't know, I want to say maybe three, four years, maybe more. Um, and I became known as Crazy Kaylee hmm. um, because people thought I was so happy and so positive. They're like, <laughs> how are you so positive after what you've been through? And I would, you know, I'd embrace that. I was told to be strong. I was told to, um, you know, put it in a box and thought that was the right thing to do. Um, and I guess it wasn't until I was at university where I was drinking a lot, having never drank before, brought up a Catholic, like I really rebelled against a lot of my kind of values um, and this whole kind of identity question mark kind of got bigger. And I would just drink and, you know, put myself into kind of silly situations, getting into strangers' cars, opening up gambling accounts, um, in tons of debt, uh, just not not really kind of aware of all of this just kind of being a student but also grieving heavily without really understanding it all and trying to block all of that at the same time and it wasn't until um my friend died in I think my second year of university she just died suddenly in the street that this kind of eruption of grief then really re-entered my life mm. um I remember going to the university doctor and saying look I I'm so upset. I'm so overwhelmed. I keep um, coming back home after a night out and just lying in a bath full of mascara, playing Rihanna really loudly and just feeling all the feelings mm. and admitting myself whilst under the influence of alcohol to the hospital, thinking I'm having a heart attack. Like, something's not right. And the doctor really, um, all they really offered me at that point was um, medication or um, talking therapy. Um, and they wanted to label it as a depression. Um, mm. But I had this deep knowing that actually I know myself and I have not really been feeling any of this for years. And losing Zara, my friend, really just... Um, allowed me to start to understand how important it was that I allowed my grief into my life. Um, and that is where kind of, I started to explore what other options existed. Um, so I don't know if I'm talking too much. No, but great. The first thing was, okay, an assessment of um, your health your, you know you're not doing any of the things you thought you were doing I wanted to do my dad proud I wanted to um you know be this you know I wanted to live my purpose whatever that meant I wanted to you know do well in school I was doing really badly in school um and I just kind of started to think okay like let's reset here and start with really simple things eating better drinking less getting a job um and going to the gym and my dad actually died in a gym so there was this whole fear block that I decided I'm tackling which was is a whole nother chapter mm -hmm. but that was so so pivotal um from that point I became obsessed with the gym let's, let's put it lightly ended up dating some crossfit guy and like my whole identity became about that mm. um but I it helped me tremendously to enter what I now call like the well wellness space understanding what yoga was uh, craniosacral therapy um nutritional therapy like finding all of these different tools that the doctor had never talked about mm -hmm. the crystals and things like that um and yeah I just started this journey and actually started my career outside of grief in like fitness marketing that was where I kind of went off to university and there are a few things that I probably just won't go into around I, uh, my identity so much um mm -hmm. but essentially that led me to wanting and knowing that I needed to help other people to find other options for their grief that weren't the norm that weren't accessible 
And so I literally started, I said to my boyfriend, um, who this was a few years ago now, just said to him, I took him to a, a restaurant and said, I'm starting workshops. They're starting next week. Every single week we're having a new expert teach people about mental health, anxiety, grief in a, in a local cafe. Um, and we used to go and deliver some posters and leaflets. And he was like, huh, what's going on? I was like, <laughs> it's happening. Um, and we sold out. I made no money because I put all this money into it. It was nothing, nothing. It wasn't a business as such, but it was the most rewarding part of my week. Um, getting together in a local coffee shop, working with a coach to deliver a session that all different people would come to and just learn about their grief, their their anxiety, and find perhaps a new, you know, new type of support that might help them. Um, and it just started like that. That's how the Good Grief community um, really started. And I was very lucky to um, connect with the RAF, which is the Royal Air Force here in the UK, um, and do a few workshops for them. And over the coronavirus um, kind of uh, lockdown, do some online workshops for them and naturally shifted everything online and, and you know, created the social media space community, which has now become like an online membership, online courses, one-to-one -one coaching, and just feels so aligned. And I'm grateful that I'm able <laughs> to create this community wow. and myself along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So much of that resonates so much. And like, especially, you know, I didn't even see the parallel of why I probably feel so connected to you from a distance even, but you know, the brunt of my grief and my losses all happened within my twenties, you know, 19 turning 20 with my brother and then my father and then my friend in the accident. And I've never really heard someone like admit so openly and beautifully, like to like the sort of destructive lose yourself part especially when you're young and again same thing I was in uni and then you know young and everybody else around me was just focused on drinking and going out and hooking up and like all the normal things of finding yourself as a 20 something and that that was my biggest I think as you said secondary loss in the book I call it like a micro grief not because it's smaller but because we don't think to look at it um but you know it was just like the loss of getting to do my 20s the way everybody else seemed to be able to and I I definitely I I lovingly called myself like the master of vices because no one could quite put their finger on me you know I yeah I drink one night and kind of you know unhealthily deal with my grief but then like the next night I'd be running a charity event so they'd be confused and it's like they're not going to walk up to me at the children's brain tumor event and be like we think you're you're a little off like because it was like I just would either be extremely overachieving or extremely destructive but I did it in such a balance that there was no real call for help like no one no one felt comfortable approaching me because at the same time that it felt that I was doing so well, there was like this concern, I think. And, and again, we were all, you know, I got to go through the night literally because everybody was young then and everybody was having their own drunken 20s nights. And people don't talk about that. that like we also always kind of jump sometimes in this wellness world to like, when we got it together, like, you know, the story would start with the workshops. And like, I love that you walked us through that and all those phases. And I definitely like have clung to different things that I thought would fix or save me along the way, you know, like being the best performer, being the best businessman. I had a, the gym phase, you know, like just like the amount of things I tried to control in order to not have to deal with or think I could fix my grief. Um, yeah. And then the universe just kind of blew up and laughed at me and was like, there's, you know, there's nothing to fix. You just got to honor this, you know, every day. And like you said, develop tools on this week to week basis of just by experimenting and having different conversations and going to other resources. So, so badass and, and so cool that, you know, that you're really doing this in such like an open way that is relatable because we all have those dark nights of the soul. And a lot of people don't talk about them, especially on aspirational Instagram or, you know, in grief resources. And so I think this is going to be honestly a really powerful episode for younger people too. You know, there's a whole different thing to going through, you know, in high school or uni or just fresh out of, you know, and dealing with a major grief process while you're supposed to be quote unquote, like building your life. Like that's just like, you know, you're just kind of doing anything to survive and, and really just like 
you know, trying anything at that point to see what will stick. And I do openly want to say that most of what I was offered in those same moments, I've been admitted at the end of a long night. I've, you know, I've tried everything. Like I always say, I went to the ends of the world after my dad's suicide to try to, you know, not only fix my grief, but fix my PTSD, which again, became a joke later because they can't be fixed. But, um, you know, I was trying everything. And and a lot of the time I, I was offered medication and I was told that I was depressed. And I had that that same personal experience. It's not anybody else's, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a coach. I'm just one of the guys, but I had that exact experience where they'd be using these words like depression and, and I'd go, but like, I know who I was before this loss. And it's so clearly based in these losses that I feel this way. Like you take away the loss and I, I had, that's not what I'm feeling, you know, but it's that scary thing of all the check boxes are the same. And, and when you're lost already in the world to be strong enough to go, no, I don't agree with that. I want to go this other route, which it sounds like both of us kind of did, you know, no wonder it's so rare, like no wonder, you know, and there's not a lot of champions of that for people to be like, if honoring your journey doesn't look like taking the one bit of advice you can get in an emergency room, you know, there is this whole other world. So I think that's just like really, really cool to hear. Um, keeping in like uh, the concept of the show, one thing I always ask before we go any further is just if somebody walked up to you, if it was a kid, a younger person, and just said like, what does the word grief mean? How in, a, in an everyday way do you explain it in a couple sentences to somebody? Mm. grief is just and it's a quote that you always see time and time again because it's so so true is grief is all of that love that you want to give to that person that thing that you've lost and you you can't physically do it mm. um and I and I feel like it's this it's just immense ultimate heartbreak um the other thing that comes to mind and this is you know for you and I who have gone on this kind of identity journey and probably a lot of the listeners are on it and you know trying to navigate is for me two questions it's like who am I and where is home because Mm. often that person was home it is home in in so many ways and this is homesickness that comes out of all of this that it's like I don't know I don't have a compass anymore I don't know how to navigate this Mm. And we're in that dark night, like you said, just trying to find the first foot forward. Um, and that for me lasted a long time. Like mm-hmm. more than anybody could tell me. It's not in the phases of grief or anything like that. It was just this thing I I realized I was in. And then I was like, oh, okay. Uh this this requires, you know, some love. Yeah, that's so real. And you know, for me, eventually, like because like after my brother passed, I don't even remember the order because it's just such a blur, but essentially after my father passed, we sold both childhood houses. So my mm-hmm. brother's gone, my father's gone, which is effectively all the boys and half of my family. And then both my mother's house and my father's gone. So I literally went into this with no home, like no, mm-hmm. you know, and to the, me and my siblings have the longitude and latitude of of where my brother passed in his bedroom on our, on our, our well, I have it on my back. I never really wanted a tattoo. So I put it somewhere where I didn't have to look at it, but I do love it. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's like this idea of like the last place we were all together, you know, mm-hmm. what, like that last feeling of home. And then the last 14 years have been me figuring out how to feel at home within myself, because it's not a physical yeah. place. It's a feeling. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's, it's that same feeling I might've had with my brother and my father, but with other people. And honestly, with myself which is like so hard and it's every other day and I don't feel at home all the time but like you know I Mm -hmm. honor when I don't but you know that but it's such a difficult thing because we do think of it as a physical place with specific people and Mm -hmm. if they're not there or it doesn't exist we can't go home and it's like even if you're not an orphan you're an orphan in this weird way and you're kind of wandering and that that really yeah that really resonates for me um Okay, we're going to take a break and we're going to be right back. Uh, okay, we're back with Kaylee O'Connor. And um, wow, this conversation is is hitting me. I knew I was grateful for you in the world, but I didn't think it was going to stem into 
into all of this um, and so much wisdom. I do want to tap into this. So in the book, I just, I was introduced to the idea of being grateful quite late in my grief process. And I also was quite resistant to it. I was resistant to any sort of everything happens for a reason, any sort of, well, what is good or what is great? Like, how can you still be grateful? Like, to be honest, it just brought out like, a lot of anger and it made me feel disconnected and isolated because I felt like if they knew what I was feeling and going through, especially in those earlier stages without any holistic or coaching help, you know, why would they ever be even bringing this up? But what I came to find later on for me was the practice of bringing those things up. I did notice, and there are scientific benefits to just focusing my attention on things I am grateful for. Um, You can totally be honoring the loss of something and want to change it, reverse it and hate it while also being grateful that sunlight exists or that you you have a a roof over your house or your bed is comfortable at this moment, knowing that it might not be later, but right now, you know? So I, I really got granular with myself of like, okay, in this moment, are you grateful that your eyes work? Are you grateful that you're able bodied? Are you know, like I had to get really kind of in the moment with it because I sort of hated it, but then it it sort of switched. And and part of that big switch was one of my friends um, who runs a company called The Alignment List. She, like this is back in the day, but she just had me text. She would text three things and I would know those were three things she was grateful for at the end of every day. And I would text back three things and we wouldn't talk about it. And sometimes we would never even conversationally speak, but those three things would happen. And eventually got to a place during my recovery from the accident where I was doing that with probably about nine different people. And they would get the three things and they send the three backs, but like nobody would really talk around it or like judge or try to pick apart the gratitude or go, you know, and I realized that it wasn't so much even about the gratitude, but it was about the connecting around it. And being Mm -hmm. able to share good things when everything seems bad was actually beneficial to me as much as the younger part of myself wanted to strangle anybody (laughs) who tried to get me to do that. Um, So yeah, I just want to like kind of open that up and like, and, and hear how that kind of plays out for you. And, and when you're either creating content or when you're working in your workshops or one-on-one, what do you, how does gratitude play a part in that? And especially for early grievers. Yeah, I think what you said earlier, just about, you know, getting really granular, for me, the words that, you know, really create a lot of anger um, for a lot of people, and me included along my grief journey, are the words acceptance and gratitude, because it's Mm -hmm. like, well, how how are either of those two things ever going to be possible? And I think you nailed it when you said it's like, I have, you know, I have two hands and it's actually like really, really simple. So for me, we hook to thoughts all day long. You know, we're negatively biased, even without grief in our lives. And then grief comes along and throws all the weed, makes all the weeds grow. Mm -hmm. And so these negative wires are, you know, fusing all day long. And we almost get hooked into almost like a radio that's playing um like our emotion not loud on repeat and it's really really hard sometimes grief is exhausting and I talk sometimes about um grief is always exhausting but sometimes it's hard to um know how to take a break from it Mm. and actually intentionally be like intentionally uh self you know self-soothe not avoid necessarily but actually just intentionally take your attention away just for a moment Mm. and that um, is not often talked about because avoidance is labeled as bad um, but it's only bad when we're not you know we're not that um, aware of it right um, taking over and where gratitude comes in for me it's almost like surrendering to the now and actually surrendering to the fact that what we are going through is the worst thing in the world and being grateful for your ability to honor that mm. and your ability to you know, do what you need to do in that moment, whether it's just hugging onto a pillow or, um, you know, not getting out of bed that day, or maybe it is grateful because I made myself a cup of tea and I haven't done it all week. And this mm-hmm. it's very in the moment um, awareness of where slight changes might be happening in grief. But there's also something around like reparenting. And, you know, if you've lost a parent like we have, there's this you know we all have this inner child that needs us and when you've lost a parent that inner child 
is even louder and that can show up in fear, anxiety, shame, um, just all these things, you know, these emotions. But we also have this inner parent who might say, for God's sake, stop moaning or for God's mm-hmm. sake, you're you're like still grieving and there's this critical self. Mm-hmm. And so if we can step into awareness and actually honor the feeling and kind of make an intention around compassion for ourselves, grounding and self-soothing into whatever that thing is we need, perhaps we just want a hug from that person who isn't here. And so we hug onto this pillow and actually then using gratitude to reconnect back to the senses, the earth space Mm. around us so that we feel, start to rebuild safety. Um, does that make sense? I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to highlight something that you said, which was so well said. And and I I interviewed um, Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor, who wrote The Grieving Brain. And so much of what I'm now talking about, I love that she's back scientifically, that like, that's what's going on. But um, what you said about avoidance, and as soon as it's in, like, I'm, by honoring my grief, I am choosing to think of something else. It's no longer avoidance. It's now a tool that you're employing as a strategy for your well-being. And I think that's such like a big thing to stop and be like, that's huge. You're not, you're not just deciding to avoid it for 10 minutes and thinking about things you're grateful for. You're employing like a strategy, which will lead to resilience and mental health that's going to serve you. You know, it's, it's, it's not avoidance unless you're literally like, you know, I think more likely for both of us, the gym journey was more of avoidance. I'm, I'm just going to focus on this and it has nothing to do with acknowledging, you know, the grief Mm -hmm. or, or from that place of honoring or acknowledging I'm not choosing this. And I think that's where that's for me personally, the line of where avoidance can go from being something people consider negative or deconstructive to something very positive and constructive constructive knowing you know it does actually benefit me to focus on these things that are more positive for even five minutes a day because I think about thinking about thinking and so somebody finally said to me it was probably my coach you know that said well if you're going to think about thinking about thinking like why don't you think about positive things like you're doing it anyways you know and it was like or like breaking it up 10 minutes out of a 24-hour cycle you know Mm -hmm. it's almost laughable the other thing that like I just the find the funny in that for me was I was just going, I really wish my inner parent was British. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I'd like I'd like that guy a lot more if he was British. <laughs> I always think of Miss Honey. I'm like, if we all could have a Miss Honey in the Matilda. Inside, yeah. yeah, <laughs> we'd, yeah. All, we'd all feel so much more loved. Oh, it's um, very true. It's yeah. true. It's like the, the two sides of myself. You have your Miss Honey and the Trunchable. <laughs> is just after like, you all the time uh, my brother always used to call me Miss Trunchbull like <laughs> when I was in my gym phase he'd be like oh look at you with your bun on your head Miss Trunch, <laughs> <laughs> Miss Trunch. <laughs> that, that yeah. might have been a loving cue that you were <laughs> not quite on the, on the right journey yet with your with yeah. your grief <laughs> it might have been a sign <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I assure you, most people would have called me Miss Trunch too during my <laughs> my twenties. Definitely yeah. not Miss Honey. <laughs> no, no. I think what you said as well is um, it, when you you were talking about actually intentionally choosing to do something that's you know will serve you. I think it all comes back to alignment, and actually, for anyone whatever stage of grief you're at like however long it's been for you I feel like being in alignment with your values and sometimes what can be helpful is the person you've lost actually looking at their values those things can serve as a really useful compass to help you know which which you know which thing to do next and uh, and give yourself kind of a an assessment of is this thing I'm doing just to numb out and you know doesn't actually isn't in alignment with what I'd like or what will help me and what I need and if it it is then great like Mm -hmm. that's actually maybe you do need to just chill out and you know your body wants to just chill out but some will go to the gym and you know it's for a purpose but if you're kind of just doing it you know with no real understanding of where that fits in your life and you know all of that yeah it can it can get really confusing and you always said you can't think did you say 
you think about thinking about thinking yeah 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 I'm a hyper hyper thinker I mean I'm just like because once you start to do work like this there's that later in the down the road that second trap of now you're judging the work or how much work you are or aren't doing and how evolved you have become or how you know it's just like oh my god dude just like walk down the street <laughs> like it's like you know something positive becomes something I'm like over analyzing and so for me it's like I'm my most grateful moments are any chance to kind of slow down and have one like for me it feels like even when I'm sleeping like sometimes like I, I've got like six Netflix shows playing at all times in my head like you know and that's just something that I don't know I've never been inside anybody else's head but it's just a part of the way I am and it's also a part of what's allowed me to succeed in some ways and like kind of be the showrunner producer mind where I can have multiple things kind of going and connecting but the like the need to slow down for me is real and uh, it's something yeah that I avoided for so long and and for me stopping and thinking about what I'm grateful for it does go into one channel I'm just mm -hmm. focusing on those things like even a um, heart brain coherence which I mentioned in the book there's those meditations like those those really work for me to just like you know I only think of my godson and him like the way he makes me smile or like my dog or you know and it's you feel the physical change in your entire body and it's like that is something that like I want to return to throughout the day or start a day from and see where it goes rather than kind of ignoring that moment of what might serve me and then just letting it like build up as I as I become mm -hmm. trunchable throughout the day, you know, taking on every little thing. <laughs> um, I, I feel like everybody, you know, depending on your age, Matilda was a movie in the 90s that everybody should go back and watch because I think it formed a lot of childhoods. Gosh, some people's parents might have watched Matilda. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Not to rub in the turning 30 soon, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think that's that's so helpful. I do want to ask you because I do feel like you're, you know, a lot of people that I bring on here, I'm sort of, they're people that I know that have really helped me, but it's taking their expertise and putting it through the lens of grief, you know, so that I can benefit, you know, mm -hmm. people who are on their journey. I feel like, you know, you really are like a fellow friend who gets it, you know, and this is something you do. So who do you trust or where, where do you lead people for resources? Of course, like your own, but like who's sort of, you know, you're Brene Brown or you're, you know, in, in the grief space, like where, where do you honestly curate and send people to when it's not something original? I think I've been really fortunate to build relationships with people um, via the offline workshops I did. And then now online where every single month I will have a new expert come and talk in the space. And for me, I really am very picky about who I will bring in because mm. I really need to understand are we aligned with what grief is firstly <laughs> <laughs> what the goal is around um what we're trying to achieve in this space we're not trying to say hi guys I'm here and in this hour that I've got with you we're going to get rid of your grief like right. and I have people who are very much of that kind of mindset and my mindset is grief will always be there it'll always be with you grief is love we want to we want to learn to hold it and you know um move with it mm -hmm. and so for me there it, it there are very particular spaces i will go and people i will find in order to um to do that but there are some fantastic um pages created by people like you like pe people who just talk about their own experience mm -hmm. and i think more and more that's you know I share a lot of people like um and I want I want to make sure I've got their name their handle right but I share a lot of content from particular people because they are authentically showing up with mm. real grief and that's if I could you know have had that as you know 15 year old 20 year old me that would have changed so much I'm yeah. just gonna yeah no as you look for that I'll just say like you know as I started the episode like that was something that came later in my process, but now I find so much gratitude and for those authentic people that are putting out mm -hmm. content that's really, really applicable. I know one for me is, um, uh, oh my gosh, now I'm scared. I don't know the handle. You, you say you your handle that. and I'll look up my handle. <laughs> You're like, send them to something that's like not going to serve them at all. Oh, yeah. learning about grief, um, yeah. which actually I'll have her on the podcast as well, but just, you know, mm -hmm. 
you know, when you see something, you go, ah, they get it. And that's kind of been my whole life's purpose of me wanting to be in film, me wanting to tell stories. I remember being a little kid in those moments where like something would happen in a movie or TV show and you just take that deep breath and be like, oh, somebody actually gets it. And you don't yeah. need to talk about it. You don't need to like, you just know you're not alone. And so I feel like, you know, these, these accounts, some of them, these consciously curated accounts can really be a light in the dark, especially when the dark is Instagram, which is, you know, yeah. the, all the mm -hmm. other stuff you find on there, all the, all the other flash sales and we can fix your grief in 24 hours type things. Um, did you find the handle? Yeah, it's her name is grief. So I, I shared something grief. about her yeah, literally yesterday and I, yeah, there's, there's, and I, I do share. So on my account, I will share a content from other people who mm -hmm. I think actually that really hit home or you know that just feels really right and you know people need to hear it one of my clients um and a couple of my clients actually from the work they've done have started to create even if it's poems or mm. quotes and yeah um one of them is called Sarah Barber and she just writes the most powerful poetry that comes she she calls herself the intuitive poet actually because it just comes from her heart from her grief mm -hmm. and, you know, it's just really helpful for sometimes to see what you're thinking written down because you can't put it into words yourself. And that's a gift. I feel like that, I, yeah, that, you yeah. know, with gratitude, that actually I'm a creative as well. And for me, sometimes I can't really explain how I feel, but mm -hmm. seeing something like that really helps me to understand it. I love that. That's, that's something I'm yeah grateful for is that, that I, that you can viscerally feel connected without having to say or do anything like I think yeah. that's sort of the magic of like art and like being human like that's like why I'm obsessed I guess with story and film and like because mm -hmm. there's that whole other element that has that all you're doing is being like at the same time as other people and you can feel connected I think that's that's such a cool thing um let's let's uh practice what we preach what are uh, three things in this moment that you that you're grateful for um I had my family here for the first time in since before COVID at the weekend so mm. I'm super grateful for the love that I have around me with my family at this point in time um I'm grateful for the community the good grief community who you know the members and things like that who every you know every week we speak and the community is just really supportive I don't mm. even need to speak sometimes because they help each other um, and I'm grateful, yeah, just for for this this conversation. I love connecting with people who, you know, we can have a chat and actually, you know, this connection is priceless. Mm. Actually, feeling like you know I can relate to the performer, the 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 fitness, and just the I don't I can relate to so many things that you are sharing as well. And it's just really special to have connected. Instagram does do good things sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I know it does. Yeah, I know. I know I can like my my TV writing brain is like, oh, this would be a really cool parallel like storyline. There's like so many <laughs> yeah. things that are the same. Um, I'm grateful I'm in London today and I am grateful that the sun's back. Um, <laughs> that is like just changes everything, uh, as you know. Um, I'm grateful that I took the time to do two things that I always like to do before I dive into grief, because I just never know how it's going to go, what it's going to bring up, what it's going to trigger. But I listened to a funny podcast before we spoke um, and then also meditated, um, which just uh, sometimes I'll be the first to admit, like, it serves me so much, but I don't do it. Like, it makes no sense. Like, every time I do it, I'm like, why don't you do that every day? And I'm like, because I'd rather scroll and swipe. I don't know. Like, I just, you know, it's one of those silly little things. Um, and yeah, I I am in this moment just really grateful and and grateful for you and everything that you've said, but everything you're not saying. It's it's rare to feel like sort of this connected and this, there's a true friend who kind of gets it. I feel like in the grief world that can really speed up a friendship or a connection is just kind of knowing that you've had a, a journey um, that's similar in any way. So I'm just, those days always, there's a lot more days where I feel like people don't get it mm. than I do where people do. So I really just, um, I really have just enjoyed this, this conversation. Um, all right. When we wind down, I always kind of switch to the find the funny. 
Uh, Cause when I promised myself I was going to do this show, I only wanted to do it if it was true to me, which means it has to be fun or I don't want to play. Uh, Cause mm-hmm. I've already done 14 years of not fun. Um, so I just, am always interested in, in where, where do you find the funny in life? Like what, um, you can tell a story if you want, but also like, just like what makes you laugh, like what TV, comedy, whatever, um, where, where, where do you find the funny? Well, if I'm going to say TV, it has to be Shit's Creek. I find that very (laughs) funny. I think a lot of people find that very funny. More is just, you know, an alter ego somewhere. Maybe she's a past life. (laughs) (laughs) For many, for many. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think for me over the years, um, there has been like a level of hysterical humor and I don't know if you can relate to that where maybe you just find the most stupid things funny um and uh, you know all all, even through my university period of like the the avoidance I look back and there isn't you know there's a part of me that wanted to be like that was terrible you shouldn't have you you shouldn't have avoided your grief for years cut that part of your life out of it it doesn't exist anymore but the moments and the fun and the light and the friends that I have from that period of my time who you know even if they didn't know what was going on Mm -hmm. they do now they just you know that the fun we had together is is you know that's probably what carried me through despite you know all of the other stuff going on so um yeah but I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know. That's yeah. That's, that's amazing. I love that humor has been a tool for you because it's certainly been a huge tool for me and probably my biggest tool. And I feel like what you say, like it kind of relates to Schitt's Creek in a way. It's like, that's why we love watching that show because they have no idea what they're doing in the circumstances that they're in. And that's Mm -hmm. what makes it funny. So yeah, looking back at like when I was like doing anything and everything to like avoid something that's unavoidable, like there is something that's very funny about that. And it might not be funny for a long time. Like people listening might not resonate, but there does come this day where you're like, and like, and like weird things. I mean, like, like funeral things and like things that we did that like make no sense. But in the moment you were like, of course we'll do that. Like, I will never forget. I don't know if I've ever shared this before, but it's something my sister and I to this day will, you know, in the safety of our relationship, laugh hysterically about. But I remember when we were burying my brother who had passed from a brain tumor, you know, my dad went into this, he's going to have the best of everything. And that, that was my dad, you know, like one of the Cadillac of funerals and sure. Great. That's how you're going to honor. But there was just things where, you know, I remember sitting there and they said, do you want to waterproof the casket? And somebody said, well, what, what's, what, why would you do, you know, why would you do that? And it's like, well, you know, water can get in over time and flood the casket. So do you want to waterproof it? And mm-hmm. all of us at that time were like, he's been through enough absolute, like whatever it is, the extra $2,000, like waterproof the casket. And I look back at that now and I'm like, I'm sorry. So we made sure that my brother who had already passed from a brain tumor could not drown once we buried him. Like that's like, you know, and it's like eventually like you're ready to just go, okay, that was wild, you know? And there's just these moments where you're just like, it is so shit's creaky in that way. And like, we're boring, you know, we're getting it's almost like boring when you get to that season season seven, like, you know, you know, kind of stuff, because in those days when, when you're younger and you just don't know what you're doing at all with your grief, like there is a lot of funny. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I'm the type of person that is 10 times more likely to laugh hysterically than cry. I actually only Mm -hmm. cry when people are genuinely kind. When I witness kindness, that makes me cry. Sadness. I'm like, yeah, okay, where's the popcorn? Like, I'm, I'm good. Like, you know, sat through this. I usually laugh at like at funerals. That's always been me in church. Like I just, that's my, I don't know. And I try to push that down for so long. And now I'm just like, no, that's like one of the best tools I employ when it comes to my grief is choosing to laugh whenever I can. So yeah. um, I always like to remind people that and that it's okay to be funny. And yes, for years. I don't know if you had this, but anytime I made jokes, people would say like, you can't say that. That's so inappropriate. I'm like, it's about my grief. It's about people in my family that died. Like, this is my joke, but it's like, you know, it's something that people try to talk you out of, but I do think that finding the funny is, uh, it's there for a reason and it's, it's something to do. Um, wow. Thank you so much. This was, this was awesome really. And I'm so, so excited for people to hear this. Where can people find you? 
Yeah, so um, I'm on Instagram, mainly that's where I live, um, at goodgrief underscore UK. I have started to enter the realm of TikTok, but yeah, bear with me. I feel mm, like so. I am learning. <laughs> um, I can't believe how many views hashtag like grief talk apparently gets though. I'm yeah, like, okay, yeah. they're, they're TikToking with their grief over there. I guess we, we got to really show up over there. <laughs> Yeah. And what's, it's just a really authentic space, isn't it? Mm. So you get a lot of people talking very openly about where they're at. Um, I don't know if I've seen that many coaches, but it's Mm. definitely a a space where people can show up and just be real with their grief. So if you're looking for that, that, yeah, I feel like, you know, giving yourself a voice sometimes is one of the most important things, um, even if it's to complete strangers, but strangers who get it. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Um, If people want to look up upcoming workshops or your courses or coaching with you, what's the best way to do that? Yes. The website is good-grief.co.uk. I have a course that's all about reestablishing identity after loss. So Mm. call it safety, but that's, you know, if you're anxious, if you're feeling um, like you don't trust people, trust yourself, you don't know who you are, that course is something that I'd really recommend and obviously um can support you on given the journey I've been on and also the people that I've helped to you know uh, if, I, I can't really go into detail but how much they've changed because of the mm. course um but if you'd like to learn a little bit more just get in touch amazing and uh as we say goodbye and check out what is one word for how you're feeling now <laughs> happy <laughs> mm, that's a shift yeah. um yeah connected yeah definitely thank you so much thank you for being here today thank you as well it's been great well grief club that's the show if you enjoyed it please let us know by liking and leaving a review this will help as many people who may need what we're talking about find it the fastest remember to honor the journey And when that gets tough, find the funny. You've reached Grief Club. Leave a message after the beep. Hey, Grief Club. It's Addy. Yeah, I am back talking during the ad, which should be your well-deserved break from listening to me talk. But we know sometimes that's not how it works. I just wanted to say, if you are really enjoying this, if you are feeling connected, a little less isolated and going, I only get this once a week. How can I stay connected throughout the rest of the week? The answer is social media. Now remember, when you're using social media, we want to use conscious consumption. And that's what I always promise at Share My Grief Club. I'll put it in the show notes. Anything that I don't create, I consciously curate, and it's all designed to help people on their way to honor their journey, and if all else fails, find the funny. We'll see you there.